Amen. All right, would you turn your Bibles to the book of Acts? We'll go to chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. As Randy reminded us as they sang that song, you guys did fantastic on that, by the way. Man, I felt the Lord in that song, moving in that song. It was beautiful, anointed. Amen. If you get a chance to see the movie, go see it. It's down in Modesto. I could only imagine. Amen. But uh, he, he, as he's introducing that song, he talked about the, the topic and the theme that we have been in. And for, the, for two or three different messages, I preached on the thought of things that matter. How many remember been talking about things that matter? And in that, uh, in that subject matter, in that thought, really it's tied to predominantly to our relationship with God and our relationship to each other because that is the great commandment. The great commandment, the greatest of all, according to Jesus, is that you love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you love your neighbor as yourself. And so relationship matters is what's important to God, and it is important that we have relationships with each other, and that we have ultimately, and, and primarily, most importantly, relationship with Him. And so we started on that theme, and um, we've been talking for a couple of weeks about that. Last week we had a guest speaker, and so it kind of broke the action a little bit, but not really in action. Broke the action that I was um, bringing forward. But anyway, today we're going to look at Acts chapter 9. I want to talk to you for a few minutes about uh, what a thing that really matters is that an encounter with God matters. I've come to talk to you for a few minutes today about the importance of having an encounter with God. We need to have encounters with God and not just one time. Well, that's a good place to really shout and be happy about that. Amen. God is involved in the earth today. He is alive and well. How many knows that God is alive and well? God is alive and well and He's moving in the earth and He's doing some fantastic things among us. And some of the things that He does among us are, are ordinary things in our, own, in our own consciousness. It's just like He's given us another day. Yeah. Did you know that every day with God is a gift? Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. And sometimes we just wake up to the day and think, well, wow, it's a beautiful day. The sun is shining. The birds are singing. It's not snowing. Blue sky is nothing but blue sky. Yeah. And, and, but we don't think about God. Well, maybe, some, maybe most of you do. Maybe it's me. Uh, but, but we have to understand that there's so many things that are just kind of ordinary in our life, but God is very much involved in it. Every step that you take in your life, God wants to be involved in it. We did a whole study and series about that, about the steps of a good man being ordered by the Lord. He watches your steps, He guides your steps, and He knows our steps. Amen. So God is involved in everything because He's God, and that's how He is. The Bible says that He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, and we can add He's everything in between. Hello, somebody. Are you with me today? If you're hearing me, would you wave at me? I'm, you're kind of scaring me. This Okay, you good. Well, praise the Lord. I've got some attention here today. And so God fills everything. He fills time and space. As a matter of fact, God is so big, He goes beyond time and space. He can't be limited by time and space. He's eternal. Hallelujah. And so I think, and you should agree with me today, that an encounter with God would probably be something that matters. Can I get an amen in the amen section? All right, all right. Amen, amen. This might be the amen section over here. And how about the middle? Amen? All, all right, amen and amen. Hallelujah. So God uh, encounters should be important for us to think about and strive for. As we read through the Bible, from the book of Genesis all the way into the book of Revelation, as you read your Bibles, and I know you read your Bibles, you find God encounters all through the Bible. We can start just naming them off. Adam had an encounter with God. As a matter of fact, without God, Adam would not have been. How many knows that? You might be here today and think that there's a big blow-up explosion in the star solar system and he just kind of twinkle, twinkle little star down into a puddle. But we don't believe that. 
We believe, God, we believe God created him for what? For relationship, for involvement, for an encounter. And you can just go on and on and on. We could exhaust the rest of our time here this morning just talking about all the encounters that have been identified in the Bible. But we're not going to do that. We're just going to encourage you to read your Bibles and begin to cite them and recognize them. And I'm sure there's many of you here today, if not all of you, that can quote many, many people, Bible characters in the Bible that had personal encounters with God. Amen? Sure they did. Yeah, and he wants you to have one too. And so we're going to talk about God encounters this morning and, and I was praying about this and thinking about it and wanted to talk about it today and, and I felt like for me, uh, the, the, the context of scripture that I really appreciate a lot is found in Acts chapter 9. So if you have your Bibles and if you haven't turned there yet, then turn there. If you didn't bring a Bible, you can bring your iPhone. You can open it up on your iPhone. It's an amazing uh, piece of uh, uh, technology. You can pick it up and open it up on your iPhone if you didn't bring a Bible today. Me personally, I appreciate having a Bible because a Bible isn't an iPhone and an iPhone isn't a Bible. Hello somebody. Uh, yeah, uh, um, yeah. A Bible is personal. It becomes it's, it's so much more. Now, I do appreciate the iPhone. I use it a lot for research, and sometimes I even use it to search out scriptures. So I'm not saying it's not wrong to look it up on your iPhone. I'm just I'm advocating having a Bible because a Bible is nothing but the Word of God. But an iPhone is the Word of God. It's ordering pizza. It's finding directions, GPS, it's, it's all kinds of things, right? And so it's not set aside. It's not sanctified. Don't let that word scare you. It's sanctified means to be set apart. This book here is set apart for just God's word. So it makes it different than an iPhone. Amen. And so if you have your Bibles, I'm glad you do. And open them up to the book of, of Acts chapter 9. If you brought your iPhone, I didn't say all of that to condemn you. I said that to just inspire you to get a Bible and start marking it up. Amen. You'd be surprised if you look through my Bible, you find all kinds of yellow pen marks on it. I mean, it's all over the place. My wife said, why don't you just buy a Bible that's all filled in with yellow marks? I, that's not the point. I like highlighting my Bibles, and I've got four or five of them. This is my fourth or fifth Bible that I've had through my years. Uh, and um, I'm not saying that for any other reasons. That I just like marking my Bible. But I don't like her marking it. My wife, no, don't touch my Bible. It's my Bible. And, and I appreciate my, and she marks good scriptures, but her marks aren't like my marks. She uses purple pens and red ink, and that, that's not how I like my Bible marked up. I want black ink and yellow highlight. Well, okay, that, that has nothing to do at all with the message, other than the fact that we're going to hear from God today. I approach the Word of God knowing that it is the very Word of God. The Bible never gets old. It's fresh every day. It's fresh manna. Men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds, proceeds out of the mouth of God. And it's a living word. It's a living document. The breath of God is in it. And so we can hear a word from the Lord today. And I've uh, been praying and believe that you will hear one today. As we talk about things that matter and encounter with God matters. And so let's read. Uh, we're going to be reading from Acts chapter 9, verse 1. And we'll read down to verse 8 this morning. And it says this. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of this way say this way that if he found any of this way whether they were men or women he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem and as he journeyed he came near Damascus and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven and he fell to the earth, say, fell to the earth. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And Saul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, 
What will you have for me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told there what you should do. And the men which journeyed with him, speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man, and Saul arose from the earth. And when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand, and they brought him to Damascus. Hallelujah. I want to use for my text the third verse. Where it says, As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined around him a light from heaven. And from that thought, minister with God's help for a couple of minutes here today, the thought of an encounter with God matters. Would you bow your heads and let's pray. Father, we are thankful today that we can have encounters with you. Help me, Holy Spirit, to bring this word in a fresh way that will touch hearts, that will bless your church, and encourage them, Lord, to seek you out for greater and greater experiences that you desire for them. Touch our minds to understand what we think and say today and touch our hearts to obey what you want today. We give you all the praise and glory because it is all about you and not about us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that hand clap this morning. Someone got excited about prayer this morning. Uh, in each person's life, there are... Uh, uh, let me say this again, start over. Uh, in each person's search for spiritual life and purpose, in each person's search for spiritual life and purpose, there will always be theological evaluations personal opinions and slanted viewpoints that guard them by preconceived notions and ideas. Some of it comes from the way they were trained, the way they were taught, and things that they can't figure out or understand. The Apostle Paul in our context here was a man like that. The scripture says, as we were reading there, that he was chasing some people down. They were people of this way. I had you repeat that. What way? It was those that were followers of Jesus. Jesus had come into the earth, ministered for three and a half years, and taught principles and concepts about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And then went to the cross and died for our sins and rose again on the third day. Priest sinned himself alive by 40 days of undeniable truth as people touched him, followed him, and heard him. And then ascended back to heaven. But before that, commissioned them to say, Everything I've told you about the kingdom of God, now you go. Go out and tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell others in your community about me because I'm coming again. The Apostle Paul, also known as Saul in this context, he was a theological heavyweight of his time. This man, Saul, had graduated from the Harvard school, from the Harvard school of his day, the school of Gamaliel. And he was at the top of his class. Saul had developed a doctrinal position that caused him to believe that these disciples of Jesus were heretics and lunatics. Because what they were doing, what they were saying, and what they were accomplishing rubbed against the very things that he believed in. And Saul had a heart for God. Hello, somebody. Saul said, as he began to reflect upon his own life, he said, as touching the law, I'm a Pharisee. 
Amen. That was a high honor in his day and time to be a teacher of the law. And he was at the top of his class. And then when this little band of, of people begin to rise up and say there's a better way. There is a higher purpose. It's through a person by the name of Jesus, who is God in the flesh. It blew his doctrine out of the water. It made him mad, and he felt like it was blasphemy against his God. And he was serving the same God as the Christians. But he had no encounter with Jesus. But that was all about to change. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Encounters with God are important. And so he goes to the high priest. He says, give me search warrants. Give me some letters of authority. I'm going to chase them down. I'm going to find these lunatics, these heretics, these people that are just blasphemers of God and, and all that God is. And we're going to find them. We're going to arrest them. We're going to bring them back into Jerusalem. And if needed, we will kill them. He'd already been the one that stood there with the coats and watched the first martyr die as he approved of Stephen's stoning. And now he wasn't satisfied. He was bloodthirsty. He was ready to clean house because how dare they think and promote something that was anti-God. But the problem with Saul's life was that everything he knew about God was head knowledge. He had not had a heart experience encounter with God yet. And it's not a misnomer and it's not a mistake. It is a potential crisis in relationship with God. If we ourselves entertain a service such as this and come in and all we have is a knowledge in our head and have no experience in our heart. Can somebody say amen right there? It's got to come down from the head down into the heart. And that's why he is called the ruler. A ruler is 12 inches. It's got to get down from the head into the heart. Can somebody say praise the Lord right there? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so everything was about to shift and change because God always has a plan for your life. Even when we're misguided. He was sincere in what he was trying to accomplish and do. He was trying to help God by straightening things out. Boy, we've had some of those around here in the recent past. They come into the, well, this isn't in my notes, so you got to excuse me just for a minute. Let me just get off my notes and meddle a little bit. Some people come into the house of God and want to straighten everything out. They want to straighten you out. They want to straighten the carpet out. They even want to straighten the pastor out. Okay, let me get back to preaching now. <laughs> he thought he was helping God by killing Christians. But God always looks at our misgivings, our misguidance, and always has a heart to get us back where we belong. And He's here today to do that for some of us. We might be misguided. We might have an opinion that is totally sincere, but totally wrong. No, not, not me. I'm always right. <laughs> I heard that kind of in the atmosphere there a little bit. Uh, <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. But God's intention for us is always, He's always wooing us by His Spirit to get us in the right place. And He's here today. And He's here today for you to nudge us. It's interesting as you read through the context here. It says that he, Saul accomplishes his task of getting security of authority. He's got the letters, the arrest warrants in his hands, and he is on his way. He is getting ready to clean house. He is on the road to Damascus, and he is going forward in a purpose, thinking he's helping God out. He's going to clean house with this. He's going to get rid of these lunatics and these heretics. And all of a sudden, the Bible says, all of a sudden. Say, all of a sudden. Say, all of a sudden. That's what God will do. All of a sudden, God will come down and do something that will amaze you. 
about you. Change your direction. This great light shines and all of a sudden Saul fall to the ground. Some people said he fell off his high horse. <laughs> fell out of his chariot. The Bible doesn't say if he was walking, riding a horse, or in a chariot. We don't know. But what we do know is all we need to know. When the glory of God surrounded by His glory what will my heart feel? When surrounded by His glory he fell down. And that's not the only time in the Bible you read that. There's others that got surrounded by the glory of God. When I get in the presence of God in the way I'm going to be in the presence of God, I've already thought about this. I don't think I'll be able to stand. I mean, I, can, I can't stand now. When I'm worshiping the Lord and praising God, now this is in my notes, so just bear with me. I'm just kind of, I'm not meddling, I'm just kind of getting over off track right now. And those of you who can tolerate pastor, say amen. amen. The rest of you just have to tolerate it anyway. I'll tell you, it doesn't take much for someone to touch me. If they're anointed, man, I'm, my feet are just like jelly. And it hasn't always been that way. But anyway, the point is, is that the, sh the light shined around him and he fell to the ground. And he says, the voice of God called his name. Saul. Huh? Saul. Huh? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus. And that's the God that we serve today. He knows you by name. He knows each and every one of us by name. And when He feels like it, and if He feels it necessary, he will call you out by your name. You ever walk through the house and all of a sudden you hear, sounds like a familiar voice? Rick! Huh? And nobody's there? You think? Maybe? Just maybe? Have you thought it might be God getting your attention? He calls his name because he wants to shift his direction. Because he loves us. He desires the best for us. Here's a man that if anybody deserved to be wiped out, it was that man right there. Saul had just consented to the death of one of Jesus' favorites. If you read the story of Stephen... Now we know God doesn't have favorites per se. He loves everybody the same. But would you indulge with me just a little bit for the sake of my sermon? Sure. Thank you. But the Bible does say that when Stephen allowed himself to be martyred and stoned to death, he looked up to heaven and he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God. When there is honor given... To an individual, what do we do? We stand up. We applaud. We give reverence. We give honor. And the Bible says, as he was given his dying breath, Stephen said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. He looked up into glory, and Jesus was standing at the right hand of the throne of God. And Stephen looks up in his last gasp and says, I see one standing at the right hand of the throne of God. And it bothered those stoners. The first stoners mentioned in the Bible. <laughs> yes. 
so much that they had to close their ears. They couldn't hear it. They were so cut to the heart and persecuted that they ran out of his presence. Why? Because God loves us. He pays attention to our lives. He knows when we're standing up for Him and bold for Him and, and making decisions for Him because encounters with God matter. The light of God shone around Saul. He fell to the ground. He called him out by name. He'll call you out because He wants to straighten something out. It's not to hurt us. It's not to blast us, but it's to help us, Amen. and it's to bless us. Yeah. Saul, what are you doing? Why are you persecuting me? And the Bible says that Jesus went on to say, it's hard for you to kick against, the King James says, the pricks. You get pricked with a finger with a, with a rose bush. That hurts, doesn't it? That's, that's, that's the terminology being used here. That the Spirit of God is saying, getting your attention. Those little checks, that little nudge. And sometimes for myself, if I'm getting a little bit off the path that God has put before me, He'll do that. Do you feel it? Sometimes we feel that. And it's for our good. And so he, it's hard for him to kick against the pricks, against the, the goad. And he falls down and says, Lord, what is it that you want for me to do? And we see a principle set forth here. That when we come together and congregate as the people of God, it becomes, it becomes extremely clear that we must lay aside every preconceived notion and idea that we have about what God needs to do in our service today. How God needs to operate in our lives. We cannot contain God in a box. Where we say God can only go this far and no further. We can't allow our doctrinal differences to keep us from the better things that God has for our lives. Well, I don't believe God can knock somebody down. Why are they falling on the floor? That doesn't make sense. Tell Saul that. So we need to be careful to lay our preconceived notions and ideas at the foot of the cross when we come into sanctuary. Because we cannot limit God. Some of, some of us will limit God by time. Well, it's almost been 30 minutes. Your time's almost up, preacher. can't limit God by songs. I, can I just be pastoral here for a minute? Yes. It bugs me when someone can praise the Lord to, um, to um, I can only imagine, and yet f fail to lift their hand to amazing grace. For you preachers in making out there, the pause is for the purpose of letting that sink in. We should be able to praise the Lord if we're singing Amazing Grace or if we're singing I Could Only Imagine. And here's another thing. Well, I'm just being, I'm just being real transparent this morning. Here's another thing. If you're back here lifting your hands and praising the Lord when you're on the platform, i got a real problem with you if you can't do it when you're back there on the back seat. Boy, I am digging deep because the air just got sucked out of the room. Can we be real? 
We need encounters with God that go deep. Deep waters, deep waters, deep waters. He's calling us into the deep waters. Yeah, stepping out on the waters here. Deep waters, deep waters. Don't limit God. Well, I will praise the Lord. I will come up for prayer. The pastor said there's two here that feel like that their life is over. Come on up. Well, that's how I feel. But I'm not going up there because I'm not going to let anyone lay hands on me because I do not want to fall on the ground. And I'm not going to fall on the ground. Guess what? You probably won't fall on the ground. And you may not need to fall on the ground. Okay, I, I, just, I just tore my message up. This is, not even, this is not even an outline right now. Look, here's the deal. If you are in front of the church and you're getting prayer and you think you're going to fall down, if you are like this and also you turn like this to see if someone's going to catch you, I've got a real problem with that. There's something wrong. There's something wrong with that. Well, I want to be blessed. How many want to be blessed? How about the rest of you? Yeah, we want to be blessed. And I'm not, I am not belittling the power of God because I have fallen in the power many times after about 25 years as a Christian. And that was not God's fault, that was my fault. You know why? I had preconceived notions and ideas. Can I tell you what it was? I, I would not let anybody push me down, and I still won't. I don't want to be pushed down. If I want to be pushed down, I just stay home and let my wife push me down. She does it all the time. <laughs> no, no. Okay. <laughs> Not really. Okay, 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 okay. No, no. We've, we want to be real. Can I help you out a little bit here today as Pentecostal people? We embrace all of the move of God. We want everything that God has for us. And God is a keeper of His Word. There are tongues. There are interpretation. There are prophecies. There are miracles. There are healings. There are many signs and wonders. There is even slain in the Spirit, which we read in our context today. Amen. But let me just cap it off by saying this. God does not need our help. We do not need to try to manufacture or manifest anything. When you let it be God, everyone leaves and go, wow, that was awesome. When we try to manufacture, and I'm not saying you are, but I'm just saying let's be cautious that we're not. If we try to manufacture a move of God, people, many people are saying, what was that? That was crazy. That was... Why? Because God will validate His power by His glory. God will manifest His power and His gifts by His presence. I mean, there will be such a power in the house that there will be no doubt. Amen. So, let me conclude here today. So he falls under the power of God. He gets a word from the Lord. He not only hears his name, he gets direction from God. Lord, what is it that you want for me to do? The Lord says, go into the city. And it will be told there what you should do. And the people were around him were looking at all this great power and manifestation and at wonder and confusion and wonderment singing, what is this? We hear a voice. But we don't see anybody that's speaking. So they heard the voice of God. But God not only called his name, he gives direction. And that's an encounter we want to embrace and have. We want to hear the voice of God. We want to know what God says and what His will is for our lives. And He is the same yesterday, today, forever, and forever. If He spoke to Saul, He can and will speak to you. Are you willing to let God speak to you? Amen. Amen. Three important encounters that I've come. Very quickly, I want you to write these down. Very important encounters that everybody should seek for and have. Three encounters. There are more. There are more than that. But these are the three that I feel, in my opinion. Now, this is my opinion. When I say that, for those of you that are first time here today, if I say this is my opinion, that means you can take it or leave it. That's up to you. But this is what I feel are the three most important encounters that you should have as a Christian. Number one... 
You must be born again. What a great encounter with God that is to be born again. Remember there was another Pharisee spoken about in John chapter 3. St. John chapter 3. That, that, that Pharisee's name was Nicodemus. I call him Nick at night. <laughs> Nicodemus. Nicodemus sought out the Lord at night. Because he didn't want to be seen around there. And he, and he comes to the Lord. And, beca and Jesus was doing such great miracles. He said, Lord, we, we know that you are a teacher sent from God. Because no one can do the miracles you do except God be with him. And Jesus didn't pat himself on the back. He said, yeah, that's me. Yeah, I'm the miracle worker. Yeah. No, he didn't. He cut right through the chase and said, you must be born again. That's the most important counter for each and every one of us. To embrace and know and encounter and experience in our lives. We must be born again. We love our church. We love our people. We're a wonderful family and we're growing. And we're going to get to capacity very, very soon. I feel it. I feel that we're going to get to capacity, to overflow capacity very soon. I feel it in the atmosphere of this church. It's a wonderful thing. But when you grow, it creates problems. It's called growing pains. But that's God's problem. He'll give us the answer when we get there. But my point is this. We will grow through... What, the way we need to grow is grow through conversion. She said, go. And tell them the things that I've told you concerning the kingdom of God. You'll be surprised when you just share your personal encounter. And say, can I tell you what Jesus did for me? Uh, being born again is one of the simplest acts that God requires of each of us. We must acknowledge that He is the Savior of the world. Yes. That He died on the cross for our sins. And that He rose again on the third day and He's alive forevermore. That simple nucleus of truth, confessing it with your mouth and believing it in your heart, will save your soul. Are you sure of that, Pastor Kim? Absolutely, 100% guaranteed. Money back guarantee. You don't pay for it. So I have nothing to risk with that guarantee. But how do you know? Just like all of you know. Because I've had an encounter. You don't have to raise up knowing the Bible from the book of Revelation, from the book of Genesis to Revelation. You don't have to be taught all the principles of the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, that was a stumbling block for me personally in my approach to God. Because I did not grow up in a Christian home. And as the Spirit of God was poking me and telling me, you've got to get saved. You must be born again through associations on the job telling me about church and about Christianity. People witnessing to my life. It was affecting my soul. And God visited me with a dream. He showed me something that literally shook me to my soul. And I knew I must be born again. And so I started trying to make myself better. And there's failure in trying to make yourself better. Because if you try to make yourself good enough for God, you'll never accomplish it. I say this boldly to each and every one of you, not trying to offend anybody. But none of us here under the sound of my voice is good enough for God. If you think you are, then you are debating and, and resisting the Word of God. Because His Word says that, not me. But it was my mistake to think I could clean myself up enough to be good enough for God. When all along, He loved me. When He said, Father, forgive them. It is finished. And when I came to a 
an altar at the conclusion of a sermon, that's the prayer I prayed. Jesus, I believe you died for my sins and rose again on the third day for my life. Forgive me. And something moved. Huh. Something shifted. Yeah. I got up changed. Oh, God's still working on my life. <laughs> but my soul was saved the very moment I confessed Him as Savior. And so did you. I've had the delightful privilege of watching that many, many times over. I'll never forget the time a young man, a young man by the name of Lucas, came down right here. I had a life changing, born again experience. He clicked. Saved. Over and over again, I tell story after story. Encounters with God. We must be born again. We must be filled with Holy Spirit. Second dispensation, work of grace, gift from God. Something over and above salvation. Different, but the same. Same spirit, different encounter. Where God comes down in such a measure and way that there's an overflow. There's a pouring in and there's a pouring out. More of Him More. and less of me. Yeah. And the third thing is being overwhelmed by God's glory. For those of us who get saved, we've had that God encounter being saved. For those of us who've been filled with the Spirit, had that God encounter being filled with the Spirit, this third encounter we can have over and over again as we submit ourselves in hunger and in desire. Lord, would you do it again? Surrounded. I want to be surrounded by your glory. There's one thing when he comes in us, but it's quite another thing when he surrounds us. Glory to God. And surrounded by the glory of God in that, in that manifestation, you might fall. And I've come to say this in conclusion. It doesn't impress me all that much how hard you fall. What impresses me is how do you walk when you get up? Do you know what I mean? Every person that has an encounter with God in the Bible, after that encounter, they were never the same. Not only did Saul's character change, even changed his name. And God's got a new name for you. One of these days, we'll receive a white stone that only God and you will know when we enter into eternity. Encounters with God are important. Make no mistake about it and do not be limited to it. Every opportunity you have in sanctuary, present your body as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable to God and let God's glory rain down on you. Will you do it? How many want that? Stand to your feet all around this church Pastor, today. I, you were talking a few minutes ago about an encounter, and when some of us fall in the Spirit, some don't. Mm -hmm. And when the Holy Spirit is moving, I remember on two occasions, we were in a worship band, we had a guest speaker in our church, and it was in San Jose. The Holy Spirit was moving moving and I won't say the name of the person but the person said Jesus Holy Spirit move the whole congregation went down wow Incredible. he turned to us on the platform and he said Holy Spirit he just moved his arm we all 
fell. Fell back. Yeah. <laughs> we, we didn't need anybody to catch us. Yeah. Did, it was just like, whew. yeah. The move and the encounter of the Holy Spirit. That is a good word Amen. today. Amen. Lift your hands to the Lord all around the sanctuary. Father, we thank you today for the word of the Lord. To God be the glory. Lord, we know you have special, you have special purpose and plans for each and every one of our lives. Holy Spirit, help us to find the very center of it. Nudge us. Speak to our hearts. Call us by name. Direct us. Give us hearts to seek you out and be surrounded.